Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. Um, extending on the previous video we did on the ball model of the atom, in this video we're going to uh, talk through a concept called valence electrons and the periodic table. Okay, so we're going to be referring to the periodic table a fair bit during this video, so it would be useful to have one handy um, so that you can kind of see it as you're making your notes and as you watch. Okay, so let's start with a brief bit of a recap. Okay, so we, in our last video we talked about the Bohr model of the atom, where we had a positively charged nucleus and then we had negatively charged electrons um, orbiting around the outside of that nucleus. Okay, so we had our electrons and we had our, um, yeah, so they were orbiting. We talked about this idea that we had a fixed capacity, um, that each electron shell could fit a, a maximum number of electrons given by 2 times the number of the shell squared. So we had 2, we had 8, 18, and 32, and so on. And so then what we could do is by looking at how many electrons we needed to, to fill up for given elements, that we could see that, that they, they filled the kind of, you know, filled out the shells in particular ways. And now what we're going to do is we're actually going to look at the periodic table and start to, um, start to identify some patterns and trends that we can see that connect with this idea. Okay, but firstly, before we do that, I want to introduce this idea of valence electrons, um, or the valence electron shell, um, because this this kind of concept is is key here. So it kind of comes from this idea, this old-fashioned idea, which which existed before electrons were around, this idea of valency, or the combining power of an element. Okay, so there's a key kind of vocab um, term for you. Okay, and so in the past, chemists knew, knew that different elements combine with each other in certain ratios, and that, you know, so, you know, one carbon might combine with four hydrogens, or one carbon with every two oxygens, and two hydrogens for every one oxygen. They, they observed a whole range of different compounds and kind of developed this, this sort of pattern that they could see that different elements behaved in certain ways. Um, and then what happened was that as we could recognise that... Um, that electrons were involved in actually connecting one atom to another, we'll, we'll go into that in a, in a future video in a bit more specific detail, that there was there are electron shells that were responsible for the way that atoms kind of connected to each other, and they're called the valence electron shell. And so what they are is the highest um, energy shell and that it, and contains the electrons are involved in bonding elements together. Um, maybe I'm going to say uh, bonding atoms together. Okay, to be a little bit more specific. Okay, so that the valence electron shell contains the electrons that are going to be involved when one atom connects with another in some way. Okay, and it's the highest energy shell that is there, the first electrons. Um, to either be lost or gained from an atom when we're making an ion. We've talked about ions before. Okay, so let's... And, and there are always these valence electrons, um, yeah, are, are always kind of on the outer, kind of, or the, the, the highest sort of shell away from the nucleus. Okay, so let's have a quick look back at our periodic table. Okay, just quickly. Okay, so try to get it a little more skewed. So we're going to focus our attention, if I can keep my pen lid going, we're going to focus our attention on group one to start with. Not, not all of them, but we'll kind of, mainly kind of the top four, from hydrogen um, down to potassium, just there. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite those. So we've got hydrogen, we've got lithium, we've got sodium, and potassium. And these are group one. And remember that these are called our alkali metals. Okay, so what we notice is that we can use our we can use the information on our periodic table or the atomic number to identify how many electrons that each element has, and I'm going to put those in brackets at the start. Okay, and then we're going to use our understanding of fixed capacity to be able to and and, and even just kind of you know as we trace along and we we fill in spots of electrons um, to be able to identify a certain pattern that comes about. So hydrogen has the atomic number of one, so it has one electron. Okay. So that means we put one electron in our first shell. 
looking at the periodic table, lithium has the atomic number of 3. And so what we do is we fill up 2 in the first shell and then 1 in the second shell. Okay, sodium, we have an atomic number of 11. So if it's 2, and then the next one if it's 8, and then the next one fits 1. Now here's one which, which seems a little bit hard to, harder to understand. Okay, but bear with me. Okay, so potassium has an atomic number of 19. And what we see is that we fill out 2, then we fill up the next one for 8. Now what we do for the next one is we actually put 8. So you can kind of track along on your periodic table. Um, if I just pop this down for a second, you can actually kind of count them across. You know, so 1, 2, and then as you kind of go, go on, we, you can kind of count them up. We end up with 2, and then 8, and then 8, and then 1. Now, as opposed to 2, 8, and then 9, which would seem logical, but bear, bear with me here. Okay, so what we notice here is that the last number that I write on each of these ones is 1. And so that is, that connects with our idea of group 1. Okay, so we call group 1 elements all have a 1 as their last one. One valence electron is this, these kind of edge ones, our valence electron, our highest energy electrons. Okay, let's have a quick look at group 2 in the spirit of kind of keeping things, keeping things moving. Okay, so remember that group 2 are known as the alkaline earth metals. Okay, and so we have We're going to focus on the top four again, just to kind of to illustrate a point without kind of over over egging it. Okay. Um, now, so so group two. So we're looking at beryllium. We've got magnesium. Uh, we've got calcium, and we've got strontium. Okay. So group two, alkaline earth metals. Okay. So beryllium has an atomic number of four. Magnesium has an atomic number of twelve. Calcium is twenty. And then strontium is 38. Okay, so we'll see how far we get with strontium, okay? But alright, so for, so for beryllium, we can do 2, and then that fills the first shell, and then 2 in the next one. Magnesium, we do 2, and then 8, and then 2. Calcium, 2, 8, 8, 2. Okay, we're taking on what we did for potassium and we're adding one on. Okay? Now, what we do for strontium, which is um, what's where it starts to get a little bit strange, so 2, we do 8 for the second one. Now, what we do after this one, after calcium, we actually start to go back in and fill further up. We top up this third shell up to its limit of 18. Okay, so we've got 10, um, so we add another 8. Okay, so 2, 8, 18, and then we get 8, and then 2. Okay, now at this point as to exactly why it fills up in this particular order, it's a little bit complicated, but bear with me. Okay, so we've got 10, 28, 38. But notice, as before, 2, 2, and 2, and 2. Okay, so group 2 has 2 valence electrons. Okay, so let's do it just to be safe, but let's now move on to group 7. Okay, hopefully you can already predict what, what's going to happen here, um, but I'll demonstrate it to you just to help kind of make the point. Okay, so remember that group 7 are known as our halogens. Okay, and so we've got fluorine, um, we've got chlorine, and we've... so we've got group 7 which is the halogens. I'm only going to talk about fluorine, chlorine, and bromine in this situation because iodine's got too many to, for us to, to, to help. Okay, let's say fluorine's got an atomic number of 9, so we've got 2, and then we fill in 7. Chlorine, we've got 17, so we've got 2, we fill up the next one which has 8, and then we have 7. Bromine has 35. We have 2, we have 8, we go back and refill up to 18, and then 7. So you can see we have 7, so group 7 has 7, 7 valence electrons, okay? Now let's do group 8, so for group 8, now I'm going to do helium, neon, 
argon and krypton. Okay, so what we see, helium's got an atomic number of two, um, so an atomic number of two, and we fill in two electrons. Neon's got an atomic number of ten, so we go two, and then eight. Argon has an atomic number of eighteen, so two, eight, eight. Krypton has an atomic number of thirty-six, two, eight, eighteen, eight. Okay, so what we are seeing here, if I have a look at these valence or outer shell highest energy electrons, what we're seeing is that group 8 has 8 except helium. Now the reason is helium can't have 8, it only has 2 electrons. But what it does have is that you notice that each of these shells is full. Okay? Or it has it has this kind of it is this idea of a full valence shell. Because for example, with argon, it's got two and then eight and then eight. We know that this one can fill up to eighteen, but we recognise that there's this weird kind of fills in two stages idea. So what happens as we go from argon to potassium, which is the next one, we go two, eight, eight, one. And we start to fill in the next shell, and then we get to a certain point we come back and we, we refill in this one. So what we have is this idea of a full outer slash valence shell. So what we're seeing here, by having this full outer or valence shell that we're talking about, which for helium is 2 and for the others is 8, um, that helps us to, to the, these patterns that we've noticed in these four different groups we've talked about, help to make us to make predictions as to why these different elements behave the way that they do. Why do things in the same group tend to behave in similar ways and have similar properties by and large? What it also means is that if we have a look at our periodic table, okay, that we now recognise that we can use the periodic table to predict the a position of an element in the periodic table to predict how many valence electrons that it has. Because we've now seen that group 1 has 1, uh, group 2 have 2 valence electrons. If I skip this middle section to go across to group 3, Oh, sorry, if we see that group 7 had 7, group 8 had 8. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to be able to fill in the numbers in between. So we can look at it where an element sits in the periodic table and identify how many valence electrons it has by seeing that this pattern exists. So I can see that aluminium will have 3 valence electrons, whereas sulphur will have 6. And I see that tellurium in group 6 should also have 6, even though it's a much bigger atom than its sulphur or oxygen. I can see that you know ones like francium and radium in this bottom corner, francium should have one valence electron, even though it's so radioactive and unstable we can't actually isolate it. But by, because I know where it sits in the periodic table, I can see the pattern and I can make that prediction with confidence. Okay, I realise this is a really long video, and I thank you for your patience. Um, but so we can see that the position of an element in the periodic table helps us to I, be able to predict and identify how many uh, valence or outer shell electrons that it will have. The electrons that are, we're going to see are involved in bonding between atoms, um, and they're also electrons that we will be able to see are the ones that are lost and gained to make ions. Okay, we can look at the pattern and see that regardless of where an element is, um, you know how far, how many rows down it is, that all the ones in the same group will have the same number of valence electrons. All right, thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.